Tuesday in Texas. This Tuesday in Texas. Tuesday in Texas. This Tuesday in Texas. Tuesday in Texas. This Tuesday in Texas. Oh my God. Any of you that have ever either remembered watching Survivor Series 1991 at the time or went back over the years and went back through and watched it, remember just how much the WWF at the time was pumping up this Tuesday in Texas show. Like, it was incessant. Like, they were making a really, really big deal out of it. They did their best, by God, to try and make this work. Like, even the whole notion of having this show so quickly after a big four pay-per-view on the surface doesn't seem like the wisest call, and it ultimately wasn't. Uh, but for a company that at the time was trying to test out some type of secondary pay-per-view night, and they thought maybe Tuesday would be it. That's why years later, if you remember, you had the Taboo Tuesday. Uh, that's basically what this was. They were trying to test out a new night to air pay-per-views or secondary pay-per-views. You know, so it happens sometimes when you're trying to innovate and you're trying to change your business and you're trying to do different things. Is Sometimes you'll step out and do something and it'll work, and sometimes it absolutely will not. And, you know, for this show, ultimately the results bore out that it really didn't work. The buy rate was kind of disappointing. And, you know, again, you're just coming off of Survivor Series. Like, maybe this works a little bit better a couple of years later when you had a Raw that you could go to each week to kind of pump this up and do it in between and better spaced out between pay-per-views. But right off of the heels of a Big Four pay-per-view probably is asking a little much for people to turn around and fork over more money to watch this. I mean, don't get me wrong. They tried. They threw a solid card in terms of the names. Like, there wasn't a ton on this card because the show was only a little bit over an hour and a half. It was striking in and of itself. They were expecting people to buy the secondary paper. You didn't even bother giving them two hours a show, let alone three. Like, you're getting an hour and a half. But, you know, you had Bret Hart as the Intercontinental Champion was booked on the show. You had Macho Man. You had Jake the Snake. You had the British Bulldog on the show. And then you had a main event that involved the WWF Championship, and it's a rematch from Survivor Series the previous weekend, and that's Hulk Hogan challenging the new champ, The Undertaker. So there was certainly some star power on this show, so it definitely didn't fail due to lack of star power, because this, this show certainly, certainly had it. Uh, when you go back and watch, obviously the first thing that really stands out to you from the very beginning and all throughout watching the show is Gorilla Monsoon and Bobby Heenan on cam commentary. Their chemistry... Is fantastic, just dynamic. The way that Bobby Heenan would cheerlead for the heels and he would apologize for the heels, and Gorilla Monsoon played a great straight man, you know, the Abbott to Heenan's Costello, da 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 da. Um, you know, for a little bit later on, fans, you know, that remember the days, peak days of JR and Jerry the King Lawler, those two were tremendous. And so was the comedy duo. And that's what it was, high comedy between Gorilla and Bobby Heenan. And it was really fun to hear these guys on commentary throughout the course of the show. You opened up with Skinner. Oh, boy, Skinner. This is when you were starting to jump the shark just a little bit in terms of some of the gimmicks. Ah, but Skinner it was, challenging the Intercontinental Champion, Bret Hart. And when you go back and watch this match, it actually wasn't bad. Like... It's a little bit better than you might think on the surface that it would be. It's probably a testament to Bret Hart as much as it did anything else. But, you know, when you look back at this moment in time, you know, this is about a standard Intercontinental Championship match, which means that it was still halfway decent. And I think, if anything, that's just a testament to just how quality of an IC champion a guy like Bret Hart was. I mean, you think about guys in the history of WWF slash E, that you associate with the Intercontinental Championship. You know, there are some guys you certainly associate with it more than others, and some guys that you put at the very top of the list in terms of the greatest IC champs of all time. And I certainly think Bret Hart goes into that category. So when I envision somebody that's an Intercontinental Champion and think about somebody being an IC champion, that's who I think about. Excuse me. I had to get some water. That said, it wasn't a bad opener to the show, but... Honestly, the match that came up next was the match that had the most heat to it, had the most emotion wrapped up to it. 
And that's Macho Man versus Jake the Snake Roberts. This is at the time that Jake the Snake had turned heel. This is off the heels of the Cobra attack where this damn Cobra had bitten Macho's arm and he wasn't, wasn't able to get it off. Like, and then Jake's starting to lust for Miss Elizabeth in a kind of creepy way. And even when you go back and watch this, the interviews before the matches of both of these guys were absolutely perfect for their characters. In terms of presentation, in terms of approach, in terms of the content was what was of what was said, fantastic. Just fantastic. And when you think about the overproduced nature of professional wrestling today, where you would have this type of feud that has so much emotion and it hits so close to home for so many and certainly would hit cl so close to home for the Macho Man character, you would still see guys having heel get standard entrance, baby face get standard entrance, and we kind of stand around and it just is stupid. Here, Jake didn't even make it down to the ring before Macho was attacking him from behind. Like, that's real. That's believable. And like the first few minutes of the match, is Macho getting a ton of shit in? Like, this is the bottled up, festered frustration. And the crowd was just crazy for it. Because it made sense. It was relatable. And this is exactly how you should do this stuff. And even as the match went along, like, you know, once, once it, the match was over, like, just because Macho won, like, it was far from over. Like, it's crazy how Macho won. And he was going back to get more damage in on Jake because he wanted some revenge. And then Jake eventually starts getting his, and it all culminates with ultimately Jake manhandling Liz and slapping her. And then you have the post-match interviews with both of these guys afterwards. It really is a shame that this didn't play out all the way to WrestleMania. And they ended up having different plans for both of these guys. This ended up wrapping up very, very quickly. But this should have been something that had some type of steel cage type of blow off at a WrestleMania. It really should have. Because just the human element there was just fantastic. And you had two guys at the peak of their powers, the peak of their careers, just magicians for who they were and what they did. It was fantastic to watch this. Warlord versus Barbarian is more of a uh, peak steroid era <laughs> match for WWF, admittedly. Just two power guys kind of lumbering around a little bit, although, although obviously Davy Boy could move around some. Warlord certainly didn't move that well, but it, uh, well enough. A solid, you know, typical type of big man match that most of the newer fans wouldn't get into, wouldn't like, and I, and I understand that. Like, this, this is not necessarily the type of match that would appeal a lot. It would appeal a lot more to somebody like me who grew up on Davy Boy not because Davy Boy was a big roided up freak, but because the British Bulldog was fucking awesome. And we loved the British Bulldog back in the day. Like, there's an emotional connection there to the wrestler, the character, the talent uh, that a newer generation just won't get or understand. Again, I get it. I understand that. And I'm here to criticize them for that. Um, you have one tag match, Million Dollar Man and Repo Man, Barry Darso, how about that, versus Tito, Sa Tito Santana El Matador. And Virgil, that's right, wrestling superstar Virgil himself. And we can joke about Virgil all you want, but man, at this time, <laughs> the old black man servant for the million dollar man that was named after Dusty's <laughs> real name, Virgil was over as hell. As he had just recently turned on the million dollar man, like, people have been waiting for that for a long time long time and granted not much came out of it after this but to think about how much the people wanted Virgil to have his comeuppance on the million dollar man and how much they wanted the million dollar man uh, to get what was coming to him you know really is a testament to the million dollar man it speaks to just how quality and credible and talented of a heel he was in that company in that role at that time uh, just a lot of fun not, nothing really to write home about in the match itself. You know, kind of a standard heel versus babyface, A, B, C, you know, match by numbers type of match. And that's okay. Like, this is, again, was film. When you think about this show in large part, there were really two big things that this show was truly built on. That was Macho Man versus Jake and Hogan versus Taker for the WWF Championship. You know, other things were just about featuring guys or playing off of other stories, extending other stories, filling time, basically. So that's understandable. 
Uh, but your main event, a year after debuting in the company at Survivor Series 1990, The Undertaker walked out of Survivor Series 91 thanks to some help and assistance with Ric Flair as the new WWF Champion. I, I cannot emphasize enough like just how big of a deal this was. Because a lot of people didn't beat Hogan. Like, Hogan losing, you could say, it happened. But it happened so rarely, even by hookish, crookish means, that when somebody beat him, it was really cementing their place at the top. Now, what they did with it afterwards could be something different. But, you know, when you, you beat Hogan, like, that meant something. When you got one over on Hogan, that was a big freaking deal. Because Terry used to protect Terry, Vince used to protect Terry. So when they did it, they really were making a statement that they believed in that other person. They felt it was the timing was right, etc. And they certainly felt the timing was right for Taker. What I, what I think was unfortunate here is that I think there would have been much more appeal, ironically, if you would have had Taker carry that belt to Mania and have Hogan beat him there. But then when you look at this, you say, well, then there's no streak. Yeah, true. <laughs> um, but this was all a plot device. They knew where they were eventually going. And that's clear by this point. They've got Ric Flair coming out. You've got President Jack Tunney there. You've got this rematch because Taker won it under questionable means. And this match here, uh, you know, I will say this. It was better than the Survivor Series match. I still, all these years later, trying to figure out what the hell happened with Taker on that spot when he was running the ropes. Did he, like, misjudge and fall down, or did the ropes, like, snap up on him too quickly? Like, he's a big 6'9", 6'10", 300-pound guy going to the ropes, and then all of a sudden the ropes are flapping, and Taker's laying on the ground. You're like, what the sad hell happened here? Uh, but going back and watching this match, it's amazing to see just how great of an athlete Taker was at this time, and just how well he could move, and just how different and kind of revolutionary almost I would say he was as an in-ring performer for a guy of his size it was just incredible where Hogan was mostly uh we're gonna we're gonna play close to the vest brother <laughs> I will be a baby face that rakes you in the eyes a bunch brother <laughs> um but of course the finish here was Flair tried to get involved distracting Paul Bear tried to get involved and then ultimately that backfired Hogan um, emptied out the urn, threw some ashes in Taker's eyes, and ended up not hitting the big boot of the leg drop on him to finish him off, but just doing an old roll-up one, two, three finish as Ric Flair is trying to hold up Jack Tunney so he could show Jack Tunney what's going on. A couple of things about this match. Number one, if you went back and watched this, you would think, oh, okay, so they were clearly going with uh, Flair and Hogan, who's the real world's champion at WrestleMania 8. Yeah, except none of that crap ever happened. Number two, you're sitting there saying, well, where does Lee Taker? How did the heck do they get to Jake? Like, yeah, things really changed very, very quickly in that time between November of 91 and then as you got to WrestleMania 8 uh, the next year. Um, and then number three, like, God, Jack Tunney is one of the great heel characters ever. Like, absolutely mayonnaise, play it straight, down the middle, no variation in any way. The heels hated him. The faces hated him. The babyface fans despised him. The heel fans despised him. Like, I know putting Jack Tunney on camera was a bit of a rig by Vince, and it was just a way to do something with him. But when you think about authority figures in the history of professional wrestling, there are few that are better, few that are more significant, few that had more impact, few that were more over and more reviled and hated for doing very little except playing it straight down the middle quite like WWF President Jack Tunney. Like, even to this day, we invoke the name Jack Tunney and it evokes all types of emotions out of us. Just fantastic. Uh, as far as Tuesday in Texas, this is largely a show, admittedly, that you don't have to feel pressed that you need to see. If you want to go see it just to appreciate history and you'll know, maybe see how an emotional feud like Jake versus Randy was, I would certainly recommend go back and watching it for that. Um, and it was an hour and a half show, so it's not that bad. And you get a chance to see uh, Taker in a main event as a world champion, which was very early on in his career and, you know, very unprecedented for somebody to beat Take or beat Hogan like that. Um, so anyways, that's it. That's my review of Tuesday in Texas. This Tuesday in Texas. 
The 30 Days of Taker series continues rolling on. Got a couple more days left. I'll see you next time.